you're not alone. If you need someone to talk to today, please contact Crisis Services Canada by either calling them at 1-833-456-4566 all hours of the day, or you can text them at 45645 at 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. Eastern Time. Remember, you're not alone, and Crisis Services Canada is here to help. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Coffee with Graham on ASTV Productions. I'm your host, Graham Forsyth. Glad to be back here for another week, uh, another edition of Coffee with Graham here on the network. This edition of the show brought to you by AETI, Case Financial Group, Evolve Green Pilot Mount Hockey Academy, and Toby Hockey. A lot to talk about in today's edition of Coffee with Graham. I'm going to be starting off the show by being joined by man himself, Cody Wall, on this week's edition, this episode's edition of Off the Wall with Cody. He's going to be coming on the show to talk about the players he's interviewed so far uh, who will be competing in the 2022 Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp. We'll also be showing B-roll to you guys from some of the most interesting things, most notable most notable things that Cody Wall did in his first installment of uh, Off the Wall with Cody as it is now a full TV show that can be seen uh, on the network. Uh, we'll find out when uh, from Cody but uh coming up here and yeah also going to be talking about uh to cody about the uh other players that he'll be uh looking to interview as well as um an interview that he's done that we didn't talk that we won't be talking about in today's episode and some other things as well as our 2022 western canada hockey exposure camp coverage continues here on coffee with graham so without further ado the first out of the three guests that is joining the show today stay tuned later on in the episode to find out the other two people who will be joining the show but it's off the wall with cody with cody wall to start things off here on this tuesday morning april 26th here on coffee with graham on astv productions cue the intro Another Tuesday, another edition of Off the Wall with Cody here on Coffee with Graham with Cody Wall. Cody, great to have you back on here on this Tuesday morning, as always, uh, as we've recently been talking about the 2022 Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp that will be held from May 6th to May 8th. This will be the uh, third time we'll be talking about it today, Cody. I'm, I'm excited to get it going with you again today. Uh, how are you doing on this Tuesday morning, man? Doing great here, Graham. Uh, as always, great to talk to you here on Tuesday mornings and, uh, you know, talk a little bit of hockey and, like you said, talk some Western uh, Canada exposure camp. You've had a chance to to interview some players already, Cody, and uh, Off the Wall, of course, uh, it's kind of its own show now. I mean, we, we'll still do the segment on here every week on uh, Tuesdays on Coffee with Graham, but uh, take me through what it was like doing your uh, – first few interviews with these uh, players that we'll be seeing coming up. Definitely get a bit of a, a different view of how everything, uh, how, what goes into making these shows happen. Like, uh, you know, uh, kudos to you, Graham, for, for doing this. I've definitely opened my eyes. It's opened my eyes here. Uh, definitely about, you know, the stuff you got to juggle to make the show go, uh, you, you know, finding guests, uh, understanding the software, all that uh, definitely is new to me, but it's exciting and, uh, you know, it's learning curve, definitely. Yeah, and you know what, for your first time, you did a pretty darn good job, Cody, of uh, doing it. And you know what, You'll, you're 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 only going to get better, which uh, is, is something I can't stress enough. So keep up the great work that you've been doing uh, in your first episode of Off the Wall with Cody. Tell uh, the viewers when you're... Uh, show airs separately from the show coffee with graham yeah so so far we've uh, been doing it last week we did it tuesday 
uh, Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Central Time. That's uh, the time we've kind of uh, talked and arranged to, to go. Uh, I'm not sure if that's set in stone or if that's going to be moving around to a different day. I know we do have a bit of a, a full day, it seems, on Tuesdays, and then there's other days where maybe it's a little less packed. So uh, still some range to play there a little bit. Well, there you go, folks. If you want to check out Cody's uh, show separately from here off the wall with Cody, check it out on uh, every Tuesday night for uh, now at this point, since it will be airing every Tuesday night here at this point at 7 p.m. Central Time. But it's time to dive in now into uh, some of the things you talk about, some notable things. Uh, we'll play this clip first. It's from your interview with James Hooden, and he's talking about his strengths. Take a listen, folks. I'd say definitely. So yeah, shooting would be probably, it's definitely up there. Um, my size and my ability to play physical and like keep clean physical, not playing dirty. And my, definitely my game sense, both offensive and defensive are, are my top, my top skill sets for sure. It's kind of being one I, of those two fast skater for being as big as I am. I'm pretty mobile. So James Hooden there, Cody, like you said, and uh, like was just shown, talking about his strengths as a hockey player. Talk about what stood out the most of just the answer James gave to you. Yeah, one thing he really uh, stressed was uh, his shooting. That's something that he's really taken pride in uh, at working on. And that's something you can definitely see from uh, checking out his stats definitely a uh, goal scorer scorer on the team you know he finished second on his team with 14 goals on the year so definitely uh, one of his strong suits being his shot uh, his physical frame he's also a big body guy so definitely those are two uh, the main standout points that uh, I after talking to James uh, I found yeah Kelowna Chiefs forward um six foot three 187 pounds 18 years old the 2003 born player from winnipeg manitoba that you got to interview like you said having 14 goals this season in the 42 games he played with the Kelowna chiefs in the kijhl um another player you had a chance to interview was uh well before we get into that actually is just uh, another thing that you had a chance to ask uh, james hooden about was um just the the things that he's been working on take a listen i think definitely uh something that i'm going to be working on quite a bit uh you know as a big big body like me if i can be fastest skater out there that's that's something that's just going to be deadly towards teams and uh definitely that and i'm gonna tone in my shooting more and probably my stick handling out of a so stick handling out of a target to hit a to into a quick shot. It's def- close proximity uh, uh, moves. Yeah, that's definitely going to be on my priority list for things I need to work on. Is but definitely skating is going to be up there. So obviously, always cool to to hear about what players. Uh, take take notice of in their game to to improve a certain aspect of their game and for james obviously saying the things he said here about what he's been working on talk about what stood out the most to you about that answer that james took to that or that james gave for that question that you asked yeah for a taller guy uh often players gotta work on their foot speed that's something he had mentioned uh he's not gonna shy away from continuing to uh, work on, you, you know, foot speed, always a uh, key, impo- key part of the game when you're able to, you know, find your way to the puck quicker, makes it easier for you to make plays. And if you do have a little bit more speed, uh, a little bit more time always helps with your hockey sense as well. So speed, definitely a, a key contributor. One of the things uh, I took out of my interview with James there. Yeah, foot speed, no doubt, very important in in hockey and just important in any sport, right? That uh, you know, that that you're using your feet in, which is which is every sport in the world, right? But um, Caden Wilkins 
is another player you had a chance to interview. Uh, we talked about him last week. Uh, you know, you had a chance to ask him about his inspiration. Here's Cody doing that in his first installment of Off the Wall with Cody with Caden Wilkins. Take a listen. Um, it would probably be my dad because he put me in hockey as like when I was like four, and then I just caught loved playing and I just carried on into like PUE and then into U15 and hopefully for a lot longer if I can play that long. And of course, uh, Caden Wilkins there, Cody, talking about, you know, his inspiration. Uh, was it surprising to hear the answer he gave? No, you know what? Uh, for a guy of his age, you know, for, for him to pick his family, his dad, as one of the inspirations, definitely – uh, it wasn't something that, that came as real unexpected. Uh, players growing up definitely lean a lot on their parents. They do a lot uh, to, you know, tr help players pursue their dreams, you know, bringing them to practices uh, all over Western Canada here, uh, you know, going to tournaments that uh, are, you know, going away to or tournaments where you have to, you know, uh, drive quite a bit. You know, all the sacrifices that your that parents make definitely wasn't too surprising to hear that his father was one of his inspirations. Yeah, parents sacrifice so much to allow these hockey players, uh, these young hockey players, too, to, you know, do the things that uh, they ought to do to, to help them get there. And it's it's a big sacrifice for sure uh, for the parents, you know, a big commitment and uh yeah, just for uh, you know, Caden Wilkins' dad to to be his inspiration makes makes total sense because of those things, taking those things into account. But another thing you asked uh, Caden Wilkins about before that played for the Stars Hockey Academy U15 team this season, put up 51 points in 36 games, was talk about the things that he worked on. Um, let's take a listen to that right now. Um, my. Foot speed is probably one of the biggest ones, along with like just handling the puck and shooting in all like types of situations. So obviously, uh, for you, Cody, asking Caden Wilkins about the things that he's been working on. Um, this is a player that was over a point per game this season with 51 points in 36 games played with the Stars Academy, 18 goals, 33 assists. Um, talk about the answer you gave, your thoughts on that. Yeah, he kind of had the similar uh, outlook as James there. You know, a lot of players often looking to, you know, increase their foot speed. That's something Caden seemed to want to do as well, uh, you know, just to kind of bring it back. Whenever you're able to get to the puck quicker, it definitely makes it easier for you and your teammates to find open areas out on the ice. Uh, when you're able to get to the open spots quicker. You know, some more players are going to be interviewing coming up, Cody. Uh, I'm sure you're excited for it. Uh, one player you actually uh, also have interviewed already is uh, Amjad Dillon. We're not going to play any clips from that interview you've done with him, but uh, talk about what that experience was like interviewing Amjad Dillon, also from the Stars Hockey Academy U15 team. Yeah, that one I just did the uh, other night there. So, uh, or I, I just did it actually. So it is going to be airing tonight on uh, Off the Wall with Cody. But yeah, I got to know uh, Amjot there. Uh, definitely a down to earth, nice young young man there. Uh, very nice talk there with him. Definitely was uh, as you know that being my second week going into the interviews uh definitely was a little bit easier felt uh was easier to get going but uh some of the things we talked about was just uh you know talked about his year how they had a bit of a slower start with the stars academy and the hockey super league and then uh you know as the year progressed he personally had a bit of a slow year as well and just kind of talked a little bit about how some of the things he did to uh you know progress his season as it went on and uh, as the season went on for the stars academy as a whole uh they definitely started picking up steam and started winning some games and uh according to amjot they were 
uh, just a, a game or two away from making it to the championship round. Uh, so definitely uh, up and down season for the Stars Hockey Academy and for Amjot. Uh, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, he's a bigger guy for his age. He's a, a gentleman who's, you know, a good half a foot taller than the average 14, 15 year old man and just kind of how he uses his size to his advantage. Uh, uh, we talked a bit about that as well. Yeah, 2007 born prospect, six foot two, 161 pounds, uh, shoots right, according to eliteprospects.com. And uh, you know what? He's actually got my same birthday. It's just he's uh, about got seven inches on me. So there you go for uh, Amjad Dylan. But yeah, with uh, 32 points in 36 games this season, 14 uh, goals, 18 assists, 30 penalty minutes. Definitely a season where he uh, ended finishing up with uh, some solid numbers there, as uh, as I just said. But um, a player that you're going to be interviewing coming up is uh, Connor Allen. Um, talk about uh, just this player, what you're looking for to – you know, asking him or just take us through, you know, what type of player this uh, Connor Allen, what you've heard about him from LeDuc. Yeah, Connor, uh, is a, he's a 2004-born player, uh, plays, like you said, for the LeDuc Roughnecks in the U18 AA league. Uh, and, you know, he's a six foot five defenseman. Definitely uh, one of the things that when I'm looking for – for players, one of the things that really stands out to me is size. I, you know, I've always never been shy to say, Graham, I appreciate the physicality in the game. And that's something that Connor, uh, you can see just by looking at his elite prospects, like I said, six foot five, 209 pounds, just a big man. Uh, looking at his stats, he's not afraid to shy away. He's not afraid to get engaged in the physical stuff just by looking at his penalty minutes in 29 games, uh, picked up 71 minutes and penalties, uh, contributed a bit on the back end with three goals and four assists for seven points. But uh, like I said, main thing for Connor coming in here uh, as a defenseman, I always like to see size yeah, and like you said, he's got plenty of it. Six foot five, two hundred and nine pounds, and like you said, seventy-one penalty minutes in twenty-nine games played. I'm sure that his coaching staff and himself, he'd like to see that number kind of lower, cut that number down in terms of penalty minutes he took. But nonetheless, uh, that's the way he finished with uh, seventy-one penalty minutes this season in twenty-nine games played with the Leduc Red uh, Roughnecks. U18 double A team. Uh, talking about another player here, Cody. Talking about um, Strawn Douglas of the Estevan Bruins U18 double A team in the Saskatchewan double A hockey league uh, for the U18 A troop. This is a, another defenseman, 2005 born prospect. Um, he is six foot one, 163 pounds. Obviously, not the same amount of uh, size or height as a guy like uh, we already mentioned in um, Connor Allen, but still a guy that's got some size, six foot one, um, 163 pounds, and a guy that ended up putting up 18 points in 34 games played, one goal, 17 assists for the Estevan Bruins this season, um, nine points in eight playoff games. He was over a point per game for a defenseman, which is crazy, but this is a Another defenseman who had a lot of penalty minutes. Uh, he also had a lot of penalty minutes in the playoffs as he combined for in the regular season and playoffs to over 100 penalty minutes. But just talk about, you know, what you've noticed from Connor Allen so far from, I mean, from, uh, sorry, Strong Douglas from just looking at his stats here early on. Yeah, looking at uh, what Elite Prospects has on him over the years, uh, it doesn't look like he's going to be one of the, the defenseman that's going to wow you with that big shot from the point or, or at least that act that accurate shot looking at his goal total uh you know his u15 year with the the estevan bruins only picking up one goal as well uh last year with that covid shortened year 
only getting five games and then uh, again only picking up one goal definitely looks like he's going to be more of a pass first defenseman one of those guys who tries to break it out from their end good and clean and send it to up to one of the offensive threats on his team um but you know like you had mentioned lots of penalty minutes uh is something that you know it's hard for me because I, I like I like the physicality, but like you said, you you don't want to ever get too far over that edge. And you know, looking at 86 penalty minutes uh, in 34 games, that does look like quite a bit of minutes. But uh, you know, it's hard to say. Sometimes uh, you get into an altercation in one game, and you can find your penalty minutes ramping up quite a bit. But uh, definitely reassuring to see. He was able to step up quite a bit in the playoffs, like you said, nine points, and actually looked like he got uh, he, he's got his his shoot got his shooter stick going uh, extra in the playoffs, picking up four goals, uh, which more than doubles his prior three year total. So definitely uh, some good things from Strong Douglas of the Esteban Bruins. Yeah, Strawn Douglas finding a shooter's touch in the playoffs with uh, four goals and eight games played, which is a very impressive uh, statistic. Just taking into account, like you said, Cody, um, having two goals in total in the last three seasons with the Estevan Bruins. Uh, he had a goal in his U15 AA year in 2019-2020. Um, didn't have a goal in five games last year with the U18 AA team when he made the jump to that level. And, of course, a goal in the regular season this year, having four in the playoffs as well. But I assume you're going to be interviewing uh, Connor Allen and Strong Douglas coming up soon here for uh, your segment off the wall. Yeah, I've been trying to reach out to a, a number of players. Like I kind of mentioned, uh, one of the things you don't always realize when you're starting off on the show is, you know, sometimes it is a bit hard to – to get in communication with uh, guests and, and line up, you know, all the all the things that you need for a show. Uh, definitely, you don't want to reach out to too many people and have everybody upset that they can't get on the show. But then, uh, you know, it's hard to also uh, give everybody that appropriate amount of time to uh, respond to your messages. So hopefully uh, I'm going to be able to come in contact with uh, both or either Strawn Douglas or Connor Allen and get a chance to talk to them more about their games and uh, really figure out their perspective uh, of what they think their game is. Yeah, and I said on this segment, it will be seen on Off the Wall with Cody, Cody's show that airs uh, 7 p.m. Central Time. So new episode coming out tonight. And I can't wait for next week, Cody, once we talk about the Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp one more time, and we'll be showing snippets from the uh, most important, most notable things that you took away from those interviews with the players you'll be interviewing coming up, uh, no matter who they may be. I wish you the best of luck in those, Cody, and uh, thanks, as always, for coming on here, man, and doing Off the Wall with Cody, this segment on Coffee with Graham. Until next time, next Tuesday, once we see you again there, Mr. Wall, we'll uh, talk soon. As always, thanks, Graham, for having me on. And uh, thanks for always being a, a mentor and somebody that's been able to help me uh, get my feet going. Uh, so I just want to say thank you before we go for all that you've helped me with, Graham, at uh, helping get my show to where it is right now and getting it to the next level going forward. Well, I appreciate that, Cody. Such kind words from you, and uh, that does mean a lot. We'll uh, see each other soon. Hey, man. All right. Thanks, Graham, and we'll talk to you later. Cody Wall on this edition of Off the Wall with Cody on Coffee with Graham. And once again, talking to Cody Wall here on Off the Wall with Cody, talking about the 2020 Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp that will uh, be underway on May 6th, May 8th, um, starting uh, in Calgary, Alberta. Then you can catch all the coverage here of uh, all those games that will be played on our website at amateursports.tv, the only place to watch this year's 2022 Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp. Also, be sure to check out 
Uh, Cody's show off the wall with Cody tonight on the network at 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, you can catch it on our website, of course, amateursports.tv or astvproductions.com, as well as on Facebook at ASTV Productions, Twitter as well, and Amateur Sports TV, as well as uh, anywhere else you may watch our uh, TV shows here on the network. Coming up next, it's time to talk about some female hockey, talking with Ferdy Nelson as he'll uh, talk about the West Regional Best of Three series that took place in Hartney this past weekend. Also going to be talking to Ferdy later on in the interview about two of the latest commitments that have been made advancing to the next level to play university hockey in the MFHL. You're watching Coffee with Graham on ASTV Productions. Stick around for more after this commercial break. Welcome to Pilot Mountain Hockey Academy, your world-class academic and hockey training facility created to maximize each student's athletic and academic potential. Blackjack Stewart Arena, home of the Buffalo, is inside the 46,000 square foot complex, as well as a curling rink and other facilities. The students have a unique combination of successful, well-rounded education at Pilot Mountain Collegiate Institute and the professional hockey training in an encouraging community. The years of experience of on ice coaching propel our students to the next level both mentally and physically in a professional environment Welcome back to this edition of Coffee with Graham on ASTV Productions. Cody Wall joined me first off on Off the Wall with Cody to talk about the 2022 Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp. Joining me now on the show is Ferdy Nelson to talk about the West Regional Best of Three series that concluded in Hartney this past weekend between the Notre Dame Hounds and the Westman Wildcats. Ferdy, great to have you on the show uh, talking about you know, these two leagues for one last time here. Uh, how are you doing on this Monday? I mean, on I'm, this Tuesday. I'm Monday. great. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's a sunny day out for a change. <laughs> so we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll just think it's going to be a great day. Yeah, hopefully it stays that way too. Yeah. We've uh, had, you know, days with sunshine, days with some some snow, some rain. So hopefully some more sunshine is uh, in, in the books here coming up. But uh, the West Regional, best of three. Uh, concluded this past weekend on Saturday in Hartney. Um, Notre Dame took the best of three series by sweeping the um, Westman Wildcats. But just first off, uh, talk about the atmosphere, what it was like in Hartney Arena this past uh, Friday and Saturday. Well, I went to game two um, live, and it was it was a full house. And they said game one Friday was even bigger crowd. Uh, the atmosphere was really good. There was Notre Dame fans there, of course, and and uh, the Wildcats get such great support out in that small community from the surrounding area. It's incredible. I mean, it was it was a great atmosphere, and uh, and it was loud, and it was uh, it uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, those young female uh, hockey players, um, you know, that makes that means a lot to them, and it's not an opportunity they get a lot um, to play in front of such huge crowds. Um, we see that at all levels of female hockey, it doesn't quite get the support that the male programs do. Um, but the people should buy in and start watching it because it was it was really good hockey. Yeah, and awesome for these young ladies, these girls, to be able to experience that type of atmosphere and an experience that they've probably most likely never experienced in their uh, young hockey careers before. But Notre Dame moving on to the SO Cup, qualifying from the West region, uh, winning both games four to one. Uh, this Notre Dame team living up to the hype and uh, putting together two very solid victories. Yeah, you know what? The four to one scores were a little bit misleading. They were both games were two to one. 
well well past the halfway point of the of the second of the third period. Um, uh, but you could see that Notre Dame was a bigger, stronger team, and just started to wear down the Wildcats, who are a younger a younger group of players. Like uh, it really showed. Uh, we talked about it earlier um, on our last conversation, uh, Graham. But they their their third year girls are uh, you know they're all a lot of them are five seven five eight you know got some physical strength to them. Um, a third year U18 player going up against um, a lot of first year U18 players, the people don't realize what a difference it can make. Skill wise and speed wise, I actually thought the, the Wildcats were actually somewhat of a faster team when the game got going up and down the ice. The thing is, uh, Notre Dame was very good at, at controlling the tempo of the play. Um, in their own end, they were solid as a rock. They, and as soon as they got the puck, they didn't take more than one or two opportunities to get it out. Their, their D made great first passes, made good decisions, and they stretched out and they got the puck up the ice real quick, um, sort of sort of taking away that up and down play. Uh, and then when they got it down in the um, offensive zone of uh, the Wildcats, they they really cycled the puck well. They really worked the, the half wall and the, and the corners really well. You know, obviously, uh, the game plan executed really well for Notre Dame throughout these two games. Uh, talk about the players uh, that you saw that stood out, uh, especially in that second game, game two, that you ended up going to, especially with just how uh, balanced and good this Notre Dame team really is. Well, the, the obvious ones were, you know, um, uh, Ryan Perrett was very noticeable. She's got size, strength. She's got a good shot, you know. Kira Anderson, uh, Gilroy was good, uh, McKibben, uh, you know, a, a player that caught my eye that uh, a lot of people, I don't think she's got a, as much hype with, with who had lots of speed. She's one of the smaller players on the team, actually, was Kira uh, Merriman, uh, number 20. Uh, she had lots of speed and really controlled the puck and really made things. She was, she was uh, a, a very strong player, and she is a 2004 so physically strong, and she gave the Wildcats defense quite a bit of problems. Um, you know, in net, uh, she made the save she had to make. Um, the Wildcats, I thought, could have got the puck to the net a little bit more. They were looking for too many opportunities to make one more pass uh, or, or taking a little bit too long to shoot the puck. When they did get it to the net, they created some opportunities, um, but they were solid they were a, a Manitoba player that I noticed on on Notre Dame was uh, Juliana uh, Herman, number number nine on defense. Um, you know, is a player that I think we should probably look at for POE. Um, she's actually a 2005, and I thought she was solid back there. They used her on the power play penalty kill. Um, so there was they were deep, they were deep, uh, and uh, and they were and they were strong, physically strong. Moving over to the Westman Wildcats. Now, of course, like you said, you thought that they looked like the, the faster team at, at times uh, for, for most of these two games. But uh, they, they fell short, of course, only putting up two goals in the, the two games played. Dive more into just uh, where you felt this Wildcats team ended up falling short against this Notre Dame Hounds team. Well, like I said, you got to take advantage of, of the zone time. Um, the first, you know, the game I went to, I tried to watch the first game on streaming, but it froze up a bit. Uh, but the zone time wasn't significantly different, in my opinion. Uh, the Wildcats did get down to the, to the you know, Notre Dame end a fair bit, but they just didn't generate anything to the net like, like Notre Dame did. They, they, Notre Dame did a good job of keeping them to the outside with their strength and size and, and uh, limiting the Wildcats getting the puck to the net. They blocked a ton of shots. Um, they, were, they were in the defensive lanes really well, the passing lanes. Um, and, and there were times where I thought, like I said, I thought, you know, the top forwards for Westman, like Rice, Franklin, Anderson, they, they, they had to shoot more. They had to get the puck to, you know, that's youth, right? You're looking for one more play, one more perfect play. Against that team, you had to get to the puck, the puck to the net and drive the net. Um, and look for that second opportunity. You weren't going to beat her with uh, with one shot. Um, 
I, I thought the, the defense court played pretty solid, actually. They kept, you know, as much as Notre Dame outshot them um, in, every, in both games, a lot of the shots, Notre Dame was, was willing to take shots from wherever. So a lot of the shots came from the outside, then they would crash the net because of their size and strength. Um, but uh, from, my, from my perspective, they had to take, make more of the uh, opportunities that they were given. Um, and that's, that comes with experience. And th- not thinking that, oh, you know what, is this a good place to shoot? You know what, maybe sometimes you just don't shoot to score, right? You right. shoot to create an opportunity, and they weren't doing that as much as Notre Dame was. Yeah, and, you know, like you talked about and like we've talked about, uh, this is a very young Western Wildcats team yes. who uh, had a phenomenal season, winning the championship, the impressive 9-1 and run they went yep. in the finals. Uh, of course, not the weekend they wanted or hoped for, of course, but you got to think with a group this young with only three players graduating out, this experience that they had is uh, going to be invaluable heading forward. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, if you can't put a price on it, I mean, this is the kind of team that if they stay together for, you know, next year and, and the year after, they're, they're the kind of team that somebody would look at, like we're talking about Notre Dame now, you know, like they would have – you know, a majority of players that would be third year players or at least half the team. Right. Um, And they would have speed and skill. um, So they would be a tough team. Now it's like anything else, (laughs) you know, potential is there. You still got to get there again. Right. And it's easier said than done. Um, But, but you're right. The building blocks that Guy Williams has in, uh, in Westman is as good as anybody in the league, in my opinion. Um, and, and next year, this team, if they're together, you know, and a lot of those players that are first years, are you, they've now got that year of experience. They now can work on their strength. They're going to come back and understand what it takes, the physicality. So it's up to them what they want to do about it. But uh, the building blocks are as good as anybody's, Grant, for sure. Yeah, and in terms of potential and just in terms of returning players, uh, being defending champs, you'd have to think this Westman Wildcats team, like we've talked about, uh, a lot of people have them favored to, to win it all again next year to have a chance to repeat. But talking about this Hounds team, uh, their season isn't done. It's going to keep going as they qualify for the SO Cup. Obviously, there is going to be many different teams from, from many different places in the country coming together to play in this tournament. But just from what you've seen, how you feel like this Hounds team could potentially fare in a tournament like this playing for a national championship in Prince Albert? Well, like I said, they're, they're, uh, they're not, I don't think they're the fastest team by any means, but they are very structured and they play a sound defensive style of game there. And, and their physicality, they, they got skills. I will, they, they, their defense make were at least the game I was at was making really good decisions, really sound first passes. Um, they didn't get stuck in their end a lot um, that way. Uh, so if you can get the puck up the ice efficiently like they did, you're probably going to be in every game. Now that being said, I mean uh, it's going to be interesting to see how good the BC rep is because uh, uh, that's the first time BC. Uh, I mean. Triple A hockey in Alberta at the female level, they only have six Triple A teams, and their teams are solid. I mean, St. Albert has won the nationals, you know, when they had it the last couple of years in a row. So to get past Alberta, I think it's Fraser Valley that won it. They're they're going to be a good team. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. So you know, when you get there, I've I've been there once before, and we had a, an excellent team here when I coached Central Plains. And we made the playoff rounds, and we were the only team to beat our Saskatchewan, or pardon me, uh, Ontario, who won it that year. You know, but when you get there, it's a grind as well. And they have a full roster, and he Notre Dame was using their entire roster. That's key. That's key for me because when you get there and you make the playoff rounds, um, you end up playing seven games in seven days at the SO Cup. So it's it's skill and speed and all those things are very important, but it's a, it can become a test of endurance and utilizing your whole roster is hugely important. And and I and I from what I've seen, uh, Notre Dame, yeah, top players probably got some more ice time. That's natural, but there was nobody that wasn't getting ice time on that team. Um, so that's that's key. And I I mean they're well coached, um, they're solid in net. 
they they've got size so they can compete physically they're you know, you know so um i i'm expecting them to be right in the hunt to get to i i i for sure think they'll make the pl- pl- medal round and when you make the medal round when you get to that top 4 now it's one game at a time anything can happen right yeah so yeah no doubt and yeah I mean, this Notre Dame team, like you said, not the fastest team, but a very well-coached, structured team and a team that is very well-balanced top to bottom uh, throughout their lineup. And it's going to be interesting to see how they fare in this year's ESO Cup. But uh, I want to ask you this question because, like you said, you've had a chance to to win a championship in the MFHL and take a team to the ESO Cup. Uh, what does the preparation go into uh, from a coaching perspective heading into a tournament like this, especially when you m- don't have the experience heading into something like this before? Well, it's it's a short term competition, right? So you've got to. That's why people wonder why um, you know it's very important during the year to go to a few showcases and you know prep your players to you know to get the right sleep on the road to to acclimatize to do the right things with meals and uh, hydration and stuff like that. I mean, you know, to get into that nice pattern once you get there. I mean, it's a great event. You're totally looked after by Hockey Canada. I mean, and and you don't want the players to get overwhelmed. Leading up to the, I'm sure Notre Dame will do like we did. We, 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 We played one exhibition game. I wasn't too worried about playing too many more exhibition games. Um, at, the, at that point in the season, you know, I, it's middle of May they go. They may they may play uh, some exhibition games. That's a long time to go without playing a game. Um, this year, probably longer than normal, the gap. So I, I would think they would probably try to find a couple of exhibition games. I'm not sure if they're coming to Winnipeg here for that uh, uh, St. Mary's showcase at the this weekend. I, I don't think they were registered. Um, but you know what? There might be somebody they can play at home. Um, but you're going to practice uh, and and make sure your team is focusing on the right things. Probably finding out who who's in the tournament. Maybe doing a little bit of video studying um, on the other opposition, and then practicing preparing for those teams. Like you know, you're going to get your schedule. You know when you're going to play them, and who does what. If you ha- if you can find some video, but in all fairness, what got you there is what you've done all year. Right. And if you execute it properly and you keep executing it the way they did against the Wildcats, because um, we talked about going into this, the, they don't give up much. Their defensive structure, their 200-foot game, team, game is really good. They're sound right from the net out. So, uh, you know, what got you there is what you're going to live with. Um, you're just going to have to execute it. Yeah, and uh, it's going to be fun to see what happens in this year's SO Cup. Now, it's going to be in. It's going to be held in Prince Albert, correct? When when exactly is it? Uh, no, it's not going to be in Prince Albert. Albert, not in Prince. They Albert. moved it. They right. moved uh, Hockey Canada moved the yeah. Telus and the SO Cup to Okotoks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Alberta, I think it starts May sixteenth. Uh, I it's the middle of May. I can't remember the exact date, but they both are going to be running at the same time in Alberta. Um, and I, they did that because of everything that's happened this year. Yeah. Uh, Prince Albert has been named the host and will be going. They're still going as the host team. So, you know, Prince Albert is there. So Saskatchewan has got two representatives, right? Um, and, uh, and then uh, BC has beaten out the Alberta rep this year for the first, I think that might be the first time ever. Wow. First time ever. A unique thing is the West Regional, Graham, that we yeah. just witnessed here in Manitoba, yeah. has never gone three games. Wow. Ever. It's whoever's won it That's crazy. has always been a sweep. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and I can't figure that out, you know, because there's yeah. some, been some really good series where the games have been like 2-1 and real tight stuff, but nobody's ever been able to – no series has ever gone three games. Um, kind of, kind of a rare thing. Um, I think, I think Ontario named their rep already or Quebec did. And the Maritimes was just going through their process, uh, through their playoff downs. Um, and there's still time, but, uh, um, 
you know, it's it's going to be in Okotoks, and uh, I think, well, Alberta will do a good job of hosting this. Um, they, they obviously picked them for a reason, um, but that's that's the next step. But like I said, you've got the rest of this week and then two weeks before you head out, and that's a long time to go without playing a game. Now, I will say this. The, these teams have gotten used to that <laughs> yeah. a little bit, right? Because there was a gap between – uh, you know, seven, eight game, days for Notre Dame, and I think a little longer for Westman before they played a game in the West Regional. And not that that's at what you want to do, but um, um, it'll, it's, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, there's going to be many, many quality teams coming into this tournament. It's going to be a lot of fun in Okotoks, Alberta coming up. Uh, in the middle of May, I believe I, I did read the same thing as you, May 16th, I believe it'll start, but yeah, yeah we'll, um, uh, have to have you back on the show, of course, uh, then to, as that tournament comes up, the SO Cup to talk about it, Ferdy, but we're not done with you here. Uh, going to be talking about the latest commitments that have been made in the MFHL coming up after this commercial break on Coffee with Graham. Stick around with me and Ferdy for more after this commercial break. <laughs> to Coffee with Graham on ASTV Productions. Joining me right now is Ferdy Nelson. Uh, just got done talking to Ferdy about the West Regional Best of Three series that was held in Hartney. Um, the Notre Dame Hounds moving on to play for the uh, potentially national championship at the SO Cup coming up in uh, the middle of May in Okotoks, Alberta. But now it's time to talk about the uh, MFA. MFHL strictly here, Ferdy. Talking about the latest two commitments that have been made. Um, starting off with the Yellowhead Chiefs. Uh, forward Darby Poole commits to Akina's College, located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, the Macaulay product will play for a D1 school. She put up a point per game in regular season and playoff games combined this year with 36 points in 35 games played, 24 goals, 12 assists. Talk about this commitment for uh, Darby Poole. Uh, very good forward going to a D1 school. Yeah, this is a great opportunity for Darby. She's a she's a she's a hardworking player. She she goes 200 feet hard. She's relentless on the puck. You know, like she led the team counting all their all their games this year, um, which includes showcases and stuff, with 28 goals. So the coach, you know, I, is going to get a player that can put the puck in the net. You know, uh, Division One ACH, it's ACHA hockey is is good hockey. Uh, we have a lot of players in Minot and different schools going down to Midland, and um, and you know what she's it's, she's going to get the education she wants, and um, like I said, she plays a, a relentless style of of hockey. I know that uh, Derek Tibbetts thinks very highly of her. Um, she she's used on the power play, penalty kills. She's very versatile, uh, a tremendous four checker, and yet she comes back hard two hundred feet. Uh, she's not a. She's exactly what a coach is looking for when it comes to playing the game in all three zones. Defensively responsible, and then when you get down to the other end, she can help you offensively. Obviously, so I mean, she led the she led the uh, Chiefs in uh, goals this year. So yeah. I I really like her. Um, I I think she's she's got an opportunity and she's earned that. So good on her. Yeah, uh, like you said, top goal scorer for the Chiefs this season. Now, I haven't done much research into Aquinas College. I've actually never even heard no. of this college. <laughs> hey, hey, you know what? Uh, uh, you know how much I'm involved with this, and this is a new one for me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'm not exactly sure how she got seen. Um, hopefully it's because 
we we run you know showcase here and we do streaming here and the chiefs do streaming and all the right things that we do as a as a as a league the the league does um on on getting these girls uh promoted through our website the twitters and all those things um i don't think you can put a price on it when it comes to female hockey because these coaches are their own scouts they don't have a scouting system like the male system um so uh i had this was uh, i had to go look it up to tell you the truth <laughs> Graham, and that's unusual for me yeah yeah you know it is unusual when uh the, the man himself who puts up the commitments and has been involved in the sport with scouting and stuff doesn't doesn't recognize the college you know <laughs> so that's a first for sure but uh in terms of darby pool obviously the skill is there but obviously jumping to that next level of play college is another level compared to triple a hockey how do you feel like she's gonna come in her first year do you see her potentially making a, a significant impact right away yeah i do um I, I do because i think uh the fact is that she just plays a 200 foot game uh, i think no matter what the coach can utilize her um to to do more than just be an offensive player she's she she could be very well a top penalty killer uh she can uh, help you with a uh on on a power play with her skill set and her ability to put the puck in the in the net she goes to the dirty parts of the ice she she can score nice goals but she she earns dirty goals which her coaches love um and and uh like i said even if she doesn't you know and you're right it's another level and if she comes in and uh and ends up being a, you know, not a top six forward right away, which, you know, in, in a college program, you should come in with the mindset that you're going to have to earn that. And, and she's the kind of player that will do that. But if she's playing on a third line or doing whatever, if things happen to, you know, where somebody gets injured, she's the kind of player that can easily slide up into a top six position because she has the skill sets to do it. So um, good with the puck, head up. All the right things. Moving on to the uh, other most recent commitment made by uh, Winnipeg Ice defenseman Megan Carnegie, going to a school that's established itself as a power in D2 women's hockey to a Cinnaboyne Community College to play uh, for the Cougars for the 2022 season coming up. Uh, school located in Brandon, Manitoba, the Winnipeg product card. Carnegie going to uh, a D2 school who is coming off of back-to-back -back national championships. A uh, defenseman that didn't put up the most points nowhere near this season, uh, seven points in 36 total games. But uh, a player that took the second most penalty minutes on the Winnipeg guys, <laughs> so it seems like he plays with a bit of an edge. Uh, tell us about Megan Carnegie, uh, how big of a uh, signing this is for ACC. Well, I think it's huge for ACC. She's the kind of defenseman that'll come in and make a physical impact on your back back end right away. I mean, she's you're right. She's a physical player. She's five foot eight, I believe, and uh, and she plays with an edge, and uh, she makes it very uncomfortable for forwards to want to go into a corner or go to the front of her net. Uh, and coaches really uh, really like that when you're in the D zone. You're thinking about playing on the right side of the puck, being being defensively responsible. Yet, you know what? She moves the puck out of her own end efficiently because she keeps it simple. Uh, she's not going to carry the puck up the ice big time for you a lot and and make you know fancy plays like her teammate Staples <laughs> and those kind of things. But but she's going to do the right things and she can get the puck to the net. She's got a decent shot. Um, but again, you're right uh, physically. She's an imposing player that uh, has good skill set, and uh, and she's 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 not afraid to take a penalty on the physical side of it. And you know what, coaches don't mind that if you're taking a, a an aggressive penalty. Um, you know the silly penalties behind the play and those kind of things, and lazy penalties are one thing, but her penalties when I was watching the ice um, are aggressive penalties. She's just getting physical on people, and her size will lead to that once in a while in female hockey, but. She was a, a, a real important um, factor on that back end to, to the ice getting uh, to the finals and upsetting the Avros. Uh, because that when you when you played the number one team in the league, you had to be solid defensively. Did they give up shots? Yeah, they did. But, I mean, against the Avros, you do. It's what you do, you know, to limit the second opportunities and protect your goalie, 
uh, and those kind of things. And I think that um, ACC is getting a solid player for that level, especially. I think she could have even played, you know, Division One or uh, possibly a, a U Sport program. And with that being said, I mean, just uh, another really good signing there, another good uh, commitment that he got uh, in Tony Bertone. Um, just the way he's been able to build up this this college and, team has been impressive. And he's doing it, Graham, he's doing it with, with Manitoba players. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a huge uh, percentage of his players coming out of uh, Manitoba, which is great to see because the only other program in Manitoba is the University of Manitoba. The bison so i mean we wish we had more female uh post-secondary opportunities right in the province but at this time we don't so what they're doing at acc is is really good and we've seen acc players after a couple of years uh move on to say a minot state or another acha division one uh school to continue their education and play hockey at that next level at, at division one so it, yeah. it could lead to another opportunity for her as well. Yeah, and like you said, you feel like this is a player that could play D1, but of course she goes to a D2 school. Uh, this is going to be a, a team with experience coming in uh, to next season, um, back-to-back yeah. national champs. Where do you see uh, Megan Carnegie fitting in, and where do you see uh, Tony Burton utilizing her come next well, season? You know what, I'm, I'm not totally sure on what he loses this year because, you know, ACC can have a two-year – two-year turnover because of their programs, their educational programs and stuff. Uh, but I can see her stepping right in. I can see her being, you know, right in their, in their six that he, he dresses. Um, Cause she's, she is a, got the sk skills to play at that level. Um, they, they recruit. And one thing about Tony, he recruits and he recruits and he plays his players. So if you're getting recruited to go there, you're probably going to see ice time, right? Especially with a two-year turnover. Um, it's a little bit harder to, uh, to get, you know, like into a sort of a, a groove. So he's probably doing more recruiting than most than, than university coaches with, with, when it comes to that. Um, but you know what, uh, she's probably picked that school for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, if you're really doing due diligence as a, as a female player or even a male player, and you're going to go to college, pick a school that's going to give you the education you want. Right. So uh, you're hoping that's the decision she made to go there is based, number one, on academics and number two, on the fact that, OK, I can continue to play my hockey career. Um, so I it's I think it's a good fit for them. I think she'll be a very effective player for them. And uh, congratulations on the signing for them, ACC. Yeah. And, and to Megan on signing. It's yeah. always a great thing when players sign at a college or university level. Like I said, I think on another time on your show, only 6% of all youth athletes or, or high school athletes or any at any level get to play at any college level. So it, it's huge. It's congratulations to them. Yeah, no doubt. Congratulations to, to Megan, of course, for uh, making the commitment to ACC and uh, Tony Bertone finding another very good player. And uh, yeah, I mean, Tony is a coach that one of the things he emphasizes the most is school first. So yep. uh, very respectful to his players as well and makes them feel comfortable. Well, so going to be if you're going if you're going to a college or university program and the coach is more worried about your hockey than your academics, you're probably not in a program you want to be in. And, and, and from what I know, as much as I've dealt with these coaches, um, they're all about making sure their their players succeed academically, because if they don't succeed academically, they can't use them anyway. So they're they're in an academic environment and, and the coaches stress that, right? Right. Well, Ferdy, thanks for coming on and uh, talking about uh, what we talked about most recently, the commitments, latest commitments from the MFHL, as well as the West Regional Best of Three series that was held in Hartney. Um, I'm sure I'll see you again pretty soon here on the show as we lead up to the SO Cup. But uh, until then, Ferdy, you uh, take care. Well, and again, thanks for having me, and thanks for, for all you guys do with amateur sport, especially female hockey. Appreciate it. Of course, it's our pleasure, Freddie. Take care. Bye. And, yeah, always great talking to Freddie Nelson on uh, the editions of Coffee with Graham. Uh, this episode, of course, on April 26, 2022. Hopefully everyone's having a wonderful 
Tuesday morning up until this point. It's uh, right on the nose of 11 a.m. Manitoba time right now. Um, joining me uh, 10 a.m. Saskatchewan time is Craig Parrott, head coach of the Notre Dame Hounds, coming up next after the commercial break. Craig will be coming on the show to talk about his team's performance at the West Regional uh, best of three series in Hartney this past weekend, as well as uh, looking ahead to preparing this team to uh, go to battle in this year's SO Cup that will be held in Okotoks, Alberta. You're watching Coffee with Graham on ASTV Productions. Stick around for more after this commercial break. Why go solar? Solar is better than ever. Our revolutionary design and inverter equipment with the latest in solar panel technology for the ultimate in-home and business security. That's right, I said security. Grid security and security of your home are linked. Fortify your future today with a battery backup system. No maintenance, quiet running. Did you know in Manitoba, grid connected, off grid and battery backup systems are 100% right off in the year you purchase for any company or farm. Do you want to back up your internet, keep your tills running and the lights on? We can install a system that is right for you with battery backup fully capable of taking on all those essential loads and keeping you running. When you call our experts at Evolve Green, ask about getting your free energy audit today. Call or email today to find out what system works best for you. 1-866-5-EVOLVE or support at evolvegreen.ca. Also, be sure to check out our website at www.evolvegreen.ca. Welcome back to Coffee with Graham on ASTV Productions. Ferdy Nellison just joined me in a pretty lengthy interview talking about the West Regional uh, best of three series that was held in Hartney to determine who would be moving on to the ESSO Cup, either from Manitoba or from Saskatchewan and female hockey. Also talked to Ferdy about the latest commitments that were made in the MFHL, two in particular. Um, and yeah, it was the Notre Dame Hounds winning two to nothing, both games winning them four to one to move on to the SO Cup. And joining me now is the man who coached the team to those two four to one wins is Craig Parrott. Craig, congratulations. Seems like uh, you really wanted to be on the show today. I know we talked last time and uh, it was either you or Guy Williams that would be on the show shortly after the SO Cup. Uh, I mean, after the West Regional was done. Um, to move through to the ESSO Cup, I mean, first off, congratulations on, uh, you know, the team being able to do that. Thank you. And, well, you know my pregame speech, right, as I told the girls I had to win so I could come on the show one more time. So I don't know if Guy did that, but it kind of maybe it worked for us by giving that, that pregame speech. Oh, uh, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, and it, it definitely did help this team. I mean, being able to win both games 4-1. to one, But, of course, uh, you know, a lot of preparation. To, to go into this, I, I assume. Just talk about the preparation that the, the team went through to, to get ready to, to go for those two games that you guys ended up winning. Yeah, there's there is lots of it. Uh, you know, we've we've got lots of video on each other with some of the with some of the streaming sites and the things you can use these days in software. Uh, I'm sure a guy did the same as I did and kind of did a deep dive into the team from uh, from our preparation standpoint. It was good to get some time off after our Regina series. It was such a physical bruising series. We had some kids with some banged up uh, minor hurts that needed to be attended to for a week or so there. Um, you know, just our planning was, again, like we talked about last week, was a lot of the focus was on us, um, seeing how we didn't see Westman all year long. Uh, we were opportunity to dive into what they're doing and do a little bit of, you know, pre-scout work and talk to our team about what their systems look like and, you know, really put together a solid game plan to go into that uh, that arena and pull out a couple wins, which fortunately we got that done in two. Yeah, Hartney has been uh, touted as a very tough place to play, and it's uh, been proven throughout the course of time. I mean, I heard the atmosphere. I was just talking to Ferdy Nelson, who was in attendance for game two. Apparently, game one, it was even crazier, the atmosphere there. But just talk about what that crowd atmosphere was truly like in these two games uh, with the house as packed as it was. 
Oh, it was awesome. Uh, I've been involved in a couple games, that, you know, over my career in female hockey like that. I think the other part that made it so good is they're only really three hours from Wilcox. So a lot of our local parents or some local Saskatchewan people or people who support the SFA or our league as well decided to come out for the game. So Friday night, it was loud. Uh, there was a lot of red and white jerseys, a lot of blue and white jerseys, pretty much divided down the middle. Um, you know, we've got a lot of alumni everywhere. So I know the alumni showed up. I mean, Right in the town, the parents went to the town bar beforehand, and the guy who runs the town bar is a, Mich or a, a Notre Dame alumni. So he had the West Bend Wildcats jerseys up and his Notre Dame jerseys up for when he was here. So he was being partisan right down the middle. But the, the atmosphere is awesome. Um, I don't notice a whole lot of that on the bench. I know some of the girls do, but I know talking to the parents in the stands, they said it was an incredible atmosphere, and it was actually a nice sportsman-like atmosphere. We, we don't get to – see a lot of the sportsmanlike atmospheres when we're playing Regina's of the world from the other the opposition. But I mean, this one was great. They, they were cheering for their teams and they were doing it in the right manner. So it was a lot of fun to play in. Yeah. You always love to see that, you know, fans being passionate and into the game, but also being respectful as well. And it's great to hear that. That's what went down in these two games, Friday and uh, Saturday over the weekend, but let's dive into it now. Uh, both games were one, four to one. Um, of course, there was some time off for both teams before uh, these games were played. Of course, like you said, you guys were banged up a bit heading in. But just in terms of the, the start of game one, uh, obviously there must have been a lot of nerves with just these two teams not having that experience of playing in an environment in a, a series quite like this. Uh, talk about how things started off for the team in that first game, particularly and how it ended up uh, going along in that game one. Yeah, we had a, our period one was excellent. We jumped out of the gates pretty quick on them. Um, you know, we're a bigger, stronger, faster team. That's how we play. Uh, and we, right off the first, right off the first whistle, there we got the puck in deep and started to do what we do. Uh, it was an excellent start. I think we outshot them. I think it was like fifteen six in the first period. Uh, hit a bunch of posts, kept a lot of lot of uh, possession in the offensive zone. Ended up scoring a couple probably midway through the period, but then giving one back at the end of the period on their power play. So it was a great start for us. We got, uh, you know, doing what we wanted to do and uh, gave us a little momentum going to the second period. And as Westman is, they stuck around and they battled back and took the momentum away from us. Uh, you know, that second period was more of a back and forth battle a little bit. And then going into the third period there, we, we took it over a little bit more and getting that third goal and then, then pop that empty netter at the end. But it was, um, you know, it was a hard fought game. They never quit once and they kept clawing back into the game and hanging around. I would have loved it to, to hit less posts and put a few more in, but I mean, that's the way the team plays. The goalie was played excellent, kept them in through the whole game and fortunate to get that empty net to, to give us a little bit of breathing room with a couple of minutes left. Being able to win the first game of any series is so huge, but in a series like this, best two out of three, it becomes even more important. And actually, uh, Ferdy was talking to me, Ferdy Nelson, and he said, Apparently, this West Regional has never gone more than two games. So with the advantage of winning the first game, how huge that uh, truly was to, to have that confidence heading into that second game to potentially close it out heading into Saturday. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal because, you know, you've only got that one more game if you're on the losing end of it. I mean, this is our fourth game of, you know, potentially eliminating a team. Um, we ended up, you know, first time we went through with Saskatoon, we ended up losing that one in overtime we weren't quite ready to do what it took to eliminate a team. We, we got the opportunity against Regina and closed that one out. And knowing going into this series here, having that one game up with possibly only one more game to play, uh, we were sitting in the driver's seat. But in that same respect, our girls didn't take it for granted. They uh, put the work in that night. And the next morning we got up and did our preparation and they got ready to play. So I think from our end of it, we were, we were quite fortunate to get out of two, but we were, we were planning you know, all along to win that thing in two. Of course, this team ended up closing it out. Uh, talk about how this team was able to execute in that second game to once again come away with a 4-1 to win to end up punching the ticket to the ESO Cup this season. Yeah, it was a yeah, full team effort again. We had some girls step up this weekend, and, and you know when, you, when your team has some of the, their, your players play their best games of the weekend in the biggest moments, it, it really helps us, and we had a bunch of girls on our team show up the weekend and, and just had outstanding games both both times. Uh, our kids bought in. We had girls playing different roles, um, you know, some girls getting more minutes than others, but there's never anything wrong on the bench, and there's a bunch of cheering each other on, a lot of support on the bench. Um, you know, same kind of game the second game. We came out of the gates hard again and, and ended up getting up on them 
by a couple of goals. And then that third period it was one, one going into the third. And we knew, you know, we've been in that situation a lot as a team We're we're not built to win game seven and eight, one. So we're comfortable in one goal hockey games. And we just knew with our style of play that that third period, we should be able to tilt the tables our way a little bit more and ended up getting a couple of goals there to take it away. And you spoke to me uh, last time we talked about how this team uh, was was accustomed to winning those one goal, two goal games, right? Just how huge, how uh, significant those experiences were heading into a, a, an experience like this of playing in the West Regional to, to see it come down to, you know, being in these close games for this team to pull away. Uh, just talk about how those experiences helped the team throughout these two games. Well, we're, we're comfortable in it for sure. We we have full trust in our goaltending. We've, you know, you can see in between periods, the second and third period, we talked about it, that we're used to it. We're comfortable in these, you know, continue to believe, trust the foundation that we've built as a team this year and, and fall back onto that when you're tired. And we know, you know, nine times out of 10, we're going to pull that out. So uh, going into that last period, the, the group in the dressing room between periods were pretty confident. Um, they knew, they trusted themselves. They talked about it themselves. And it made for my job pretty easy. I mean, we just had to sit behind the bench there and open the gate and and be basically cheerleaders because our leadership group kind of took that over. And, you know, when you're seeing Caitlin Gilroy and Peyton Evans go out and work as hard as they do, or, you know, you know you've got Yeva Filipova back there who's going to stop, well, you know, nine shots out of ten. Uh, we keep them their shots down. We know that, that, you know, the formula for us to winning is keeping their shots down and scoring a few more goals. You know, this uh, Westman Wildcats team, like you said, kept fighting and trying to claw back into these two games. This is a very young, fast, uh, skilled team who um, had very good goaltending throughout the season. But you guys were able to to limit them to only two goals in, in those two games, putting up eight goals in, in those two games combined as well. Just talk about, you know, how, how you felt this team was, uh, how these girls were able to go out and, and execute the game plan to, to limit and shut down this Western Wildcats team throughout the two games. Yeah, we're, like we talked about before, we've got some good depth on our team. We can score, score on all four of our lines. It so, so happened this weekend, you know, we scored on three of the four of the lines. So we've had everybody contributing in. I really think one big separator for us this weekend was our defensemen. Um, we got three or four defensemen that can move back there. They're all, you know, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, five, seven, decent size and can skate. And, and a couple of our D-men just decided that this was the weekend they were going to skate and take the puck and take control of the game. So that helped us a lot. Westman would get the pucks in deep and we would be able to turn that real quick with our D-men by using their feet. So as soon as you can get, you know, your first steps heading up north with the puck in your stick, it, it gives you a lot more options than trying to have to play from chipping pucks to walls or, or having them right on you quickly. So I think as our group, the defenseman really stepped up, um, you know, our goal scoring depth, we could throw our third line out there or our fourth line out there and they would still get some goal scoring opportunities. So for us, it was just, you know, continue to play what we do, make sure we don't try and be someone we're not and just live in the moment and don't think about the end result. Think about, you know, your next shift, your next period and, and keep your focus narrow versus broad. Of course, this team got to celebrate yet another huge victory, uh, celebrating again since the championship. Uh, celebration after you guys beat Regina in that OT to, to win it all. Uh, talk about what this celebration was like, uh, the, the scene that was uh, seen in, in Hart and Arena once those uh, once the, the clock hit zeros. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, the girls celebrated pretty good. They, you know, we had a lot of families out there. So a lot of pictures were taken with families. Uh, I know a lot of the grade 12s took the pictures with the banners and, and with the, the cup and things like that. You know, when it comes down to those you know, us as a staff kind of step back. I mean, the girls, the ones that did the work, they're the ones that deserve. I let them stay as long as they wanted because for some of those grade 12s, they're not going to get this opportunity again. So it was it was pretty unique celebration, just even even on the bus. And even, you know, we were going to have to spend an extra day in, in Brandon with the snow that came in, so we didn't get home until yesterday. Uh, that extra day with the families, most of the families stayed. And it's a unique environment here because we don't have parents around. So it was great for the girls to spend an extra day with their families that were there and just, just the celebration went into coming home on the bus yesterday morning too. The girls are still pretty pumped about the situation. And then now we're starting to look forward ahead. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun here the next three weeks, uh, trying to prepare for this next, <laughs> this next step of our season, which is going to be, it's going to be a grind. That's for sure. 
Yeah, uh, the SO Cup, the big one coming up. I mean, what teams hope to get to at the end of the season, right? I mean, obviously winning the league championship is the first step. And then, of course, going through the region to qualify is the next. And this team has done just that. Um, you know, just where does the preparation lie now? Like you said, it's going to be a grind in the next three weeks. Getting this team prepared for yet another stage that this team hasn't played at, which is the SO Cup. Yeah, it's uh, preparation started, I guess, yesterday, but not as much. I tried to uh, take a day to enjoy some things around here, but um, we know the teams are playing. Everything's been announced. The schedule's been out. Uh, you know, first conversations with, with our operations guy here about ho hotels and food, and I'm sure we'll get into it the next three days, but um, it's, it's seven games in seven days if you end up winning that thing, and that's a lot of hockey at this level, and and that's a lot of a grind that whole entire week. So, you know, next steps are a pair of the girls will be ups and downs all week. You're, you're not going to play your best for seven straight games. So, yeah. you know, again, trusting in our foundation as a team is going to have to pull us through a couple of those, I'm going to guess. Yeah, this is going to be a, a lot of hockey in a, a lot of days, uh, seven games in seven days. Uh, like you said, if you are able to win the whole thing in the SO Cup. But, uh, you know, Craig, congratulations to you and the team on – Another big victory this season, qualifying for the uh, SO Cup from the West Region over the Westman Wildcats. I wish you and the team the best of luck, and I'm sure we'll we'll talk about the SO Cup that experience coming up once it uh, concludes. But until then, you take care and uh, keep enjoying the victory. Absolutely. Hopefully, we have another banner to talk about. Uh, but it says it's, it's going to be tough. There's some real good teams there. But thanks for having me on again. Really, again, appreciate everything you do, and, and thanks for the support of our program course and if uh the speech saying hey i want to be on coffee with framework this time may maybe it'll maybe that's the speech you got to roll with and uh come come that so cup and uh okotoks eh? absolutely have to, we'll have to start with that one on the first day too right on right on well craig uh you take care like i said and uh we'll see you soon okay thanks uh that's uh that's awesome I'm, I'm not too sure if craig was serious or not if he uh if he used the coffee with graham speech i'm not sure it was he was being serious or not on that but that that's awesome and just so cool if, if that was the case um you know this notre dame hounds team i mean one of the best teams in uh the country this season uh near the top of the rankings i know that from what i've seen throughout canada for female hockey at the u18 level having a chance to play for the SO Cup. Um, and yeah, this Notre Dame Hounds team looking to be in the mix to, to potentially win the SO Cup this season for sure. It will be going in, in Okotoks, Alberta, um, May 16th, I believe. I'll, I'll check that date at some point coming up here uh, leading up to the SO Cup for you guys. But I'm sure you can search it up on the internet as well. If you search up the SO Cup and find all the information there. But yeah, it um, doesn't start until May, about three weeks until it starts, like Craig said. Uh, Going to be a busy three weeks of preparation for this very good Notre Dame Hounds team. Uh, it's time now to send it to one last commercial break in this edition of Coffee with Graham. Coming up, I'm going to finish off today's edition of the show with an edition of League Report. Talking about the MMJHL, the Manitoba AAA U18 Hockey League, as well as uh, recapping the uh, West Regional uh, qualifier um, that was played uh, the, against the Notre Dame Hounds and the Westman Wildcats this past weekend. And yeah, from the MMJHL and the Manitoba AAA U18 Hockey League, uh, there are results from uh, two teams that have claimed championships. Um, so action in those leagues, both concluding for the 2021-2022 season. Want to hear about it? Well, you'll have to stick around and uh, watch League Report coming up next on this edition of Coffee with Graham on ASTV. Stick around.
Welcome back to Coffee with Graham on ASTV Productions, everybody. Uh, I was just joined by Craig Parrott, head coach of the Notre Dame Hounds female U18 AAA hockey team that plays in the Saskatchewan female U18 AAA hockey league. They are off to the SO Cup coming up in May. Um, should be a great experience, uh, of course, no doubt about it, no matter what happens for this Notre Dame Hounds team come then, but... Uh, you know that uh, a championship, a national title is on their minds now, and they uh, definitely have the tools to do it. It's just can they put it together, um, potentially playing uh, seven games in seven days straight, like Craig said, if you are able to win the thing. So that's a lot of hockey, a lot of days will be very interesting. But um, speaking of, you know, just championships, um, we're going to talk about a lot of them here on league report and uh three in particular so this is this edition of league report um we'll start off with just going through the saskatchewan uh female u18 triple a hockey league and mfhl to start things off here um I'll share the screen as well and should be ready to go so let's get to it here on a league report. So as you can see there, um, on MFHL's website on MFHLU18AAA.com, uh, the Hounds, as it says, earn a trip to the ESO Cup, winning games one and games two, uh, both four to one. Um, and yeah, that's crazy for yet another season of, of this being played, this uh, West Regional um uh, another sweep for the team that wins uh like Ferdy said teams have yet to uh who have played in this west regional have uh yet to uh have game three so that's pretty impressive uh stat there that's pretty cool to know but yeah um congratulations to the hounds on them for advancing once again and going to the so cup this year having a chance to play for a national championship now in terms of junior hockey something that has not happened for a very long time 24 years in fact was the saint james junior canucks winning the championship and they were up three to one in their series heading in to uh game number five that was played yesterday on monday now leading up to it um take a look so on april 23rd and april 21st um just wait one sec yeah sorry on april 21st and april 23rd so april 21st that was on thursday night and april 23rd on saturday was St. James taking on the Pemna Valley Twisters. Uh, St. James, the number one team in the MMJHL, uh, coming into the playoffs, made it all the way to the finals, of course, playing against the number three seeded Pemna Valley Twisters. And Pemna Valley made it interesting winning the second game of the series to go up, uh, not to go up, but to tie it up. And, of course, St. James ended up taking a... Two to one lead in the series after that by beating the uh, Pemina Valley Twisters. Um, two to one in game number three at the Bell MTS Iceplex. Game number four, uh, St. James went into Pemina Valley, uh, the Morris Multiplex, and won five to two. And that set up game number five in this series that was held last night. And as you can see here on the screen, it was the St. James Junior Canucks claiming their first championship since uh, 24 years ago with a commanding 5 to nothing victory, as you can see there, for special teams. Both of these teams um, ended up going 0-4 for on the power play, but the shot advantage was heavily in St. James' favor. Um, Noah Gilbert with the shutout in this game. Um, Price Greenwood, Willen Whitley, and Romanick with the goals. And congratulations to St. James on winning the best of seven MMJHL finals this year um, in five games. We'll take a look at the stats to show you guys who ended up leading the playoffs in points. It was Curtis Luke 
uh, with a great send off for himself and in off a fantastic season and a, uh, junior hockey career for himself, 32 points in 14 games played this playoffs led all players with 22 assists. Um, and in terms of goals, he ended up finishing second in goals. Only two teammate Kale Price, who ended up leading the whole MMJHL playoffs in goals uh, for St. James. We'll go over to the goaltending stats as well now. Um, Noah Gilbert, what a performance for him in these playoffs. A 12-1-1 and record. Uh, in 14 games played, a 920 save percentage, a 2.06 goals against average. Um, Logan ends, though, I mean, even though he was on the losing side of things in this series, so young still, 2003-born player, went 8-5-2, and 916 save percentage, a 271 goals against average. Um, for Noah Gilbert, he finished with a shutout this season in this uh, final game with uh, three shutouts in total during these playoffs. So uh, very important, very impressive performance from him. Um, not too sure if uh, they gave out playoff MVP or not, but um, yeah, congratulations to the St. James Jr. Canucks on winning this year's MMJHL championship. Now, in terms of one more league to talk about today, we'll talk about the Manitoba AAA U18 Hockey League. And, yeah, there's a team that qualified to play in the West Regional um, for the uh, league here. But the winner of this league will have a chance to play for the TELUS Cup if they are able to come out of that West Regional. And let's take a look at who it was. Would it be the number one seeded team in the league, the Brandon Weekings? Um, able to hold on to their series after being up two to nothing to start things off, or would it be the Winnipeg Wild looking to complete a very impressive three game comeback? Well, it was in fact the Winnipeg Wild winning this game six to three going into Brandon and uh, completing the comeback in the series after being down two to nothing. Um, in this game, taking a look at it. Uh, the Brandon Wheat Kings ended up out shooting this Winnipeg Wild team by quite a bit. Not too sure if you guys can see it here on the screen. We'll also get the league logo up here in the right hand corner. Uh, right hand corner of I'm trying to I'm trying to point. There we go. Right hand corner of the screen, as you guys can see. But yeah, you can see the shots here. It was the Wheat Kings who dominated the shot category. Um, especially in the second period with 25 shots to the Wilds nine, but it was the Winnipeg wild with a huge third period to win this game, scoring five goals compared to Brandon's one in that period. And for Brandon, you got to think um, this has to be very disappointing with just how they were up in this game after the first 40 minutes, how they outshot the Winnipeg wild as well. But, uh, yeah, the Winnipeg Wild with a very strong effort to finish it off. Um, going three for six on the power play compared to Brandon going two for five. Um, so both teams connected on the power play going over 40%. But, yeah, congratulations to the Winnipeg Wild. They'll be having a chance to play for the TELUS Cup, of course. Uh, if they are able to make it through the West Regional Series, not too sure who they'll play. But to, we'll take a look at the player stats here. Um, as we take one last look at the Manitoba uh, AAA U18 Hockey League playoffs. Um, congratulations to Logan Belton and Noah Desiver on both leading the playoffs in points for the Winnipeg Wild. Um, for Belton, he ended up leading all players in goals in the he ended up leading all players with goals in, in goals in the playoffs with uh, 11. In terms of the assist leader, it was Braden Keeble of the Brandon Weekings. Um, in terms of the goalie stats here, there are none. But yeah, those are the stats leaders for these playoffs, as you guys saw. Um, congratulations to Logan Belt and Noah Desiver and the rest of this Winnipeg Wild team on taking home the 2021-2022 Manitoba AAA U18 uh, Hockey League Championship. 
So that is going to do it for this edition of League Report. Hoping everyone enjoyed this edition of League Report. Not too sure what I'll be going doing uh, on League Report moving forward, but I'll, I'll keep you guys up to date uh, coming up next episode once that does hit. And yeah, um, with that being said, this is going to mark the end of today's edition of Coffee with Graham on ASTV Productions. I've been your host, Graham Forsyth. Special thanks to... Cody Wall, Ferdy Nelson, and Craig Parrott for joining today's edition of the show as the three guests. Um, also, a special thanks to you, the viewer, for tuning in to today's episode. And also, a special thanks to the sponsors of today's edition of Coffee with Graham in AETI, Case Financial Group, Evolve Green, Potman Hockey Academy, and Toby Hockey for sponsoring another edition of the show. Coffee with Graham will return on the network coming up thursday night so two days from now at 8 p.m central daylight time guys can catch it here on the network on astv productions on facebook amateur sports tv on twitter or on our website at amateursports.tv or astvproductions.com um also be sure to check out the guest list that will be released coming up on thursday morning uh for that episode to see who will be on that edition of Coffee with Graham, check it out on Instagram at ASTV Productions as well as on our Facebook and on our Twitter as well. Um, new edition of Manitoba Show Rise and Shine Manitoba comes out tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time. Catch an all new edition of uh, Manitoba Show tomorrow morning on Facebook, our website, or on Twitter. Be sure to check out the guest list that will be released tonight on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as well. Also, folks, I uh, want to let you guys know about my mental health fundraiser, Graham's Mental Health Fundraiser. It is going until May 10th, um, and it is uh, a fundraiser that I'm raising money towards mental health. All proceeds that are donated in the mental health fundraiser, uh, Graham's Mental Health Fundraiser, will be going to um, the Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, of course, my views expressed in the fundraiser on GoFundMe.com uh, do not align with the views uh, and opinions of ASTV Productions on Bell Media. They are my views and my opinions only. And yeah, um, the goal is to raise $1,000 at $237 at this point, which is phenomenal. Uh, thank you to everyone who's donated, even though nowhere near the goal right now. Just any money coming in in support for this is, is fantastic. There is still time to donate if you want, whether it's $1 or $100, any amount, it doesn't matter. Any amount makes a difference, no matter what. Um, and also, if you don't choose to donate, uh, if you don't feel like donating money, that is okay too, but please share it to your family and friends to, to get the word out about Graham's Mental Health, Graham's Mental Health Fundraiser going until May 10th of this year in 2022. But yeah, that's uh, it for me here today, folks. I've been your host of Coffee with Graham, Graham Forsyth. Signing off now on this Tuesday morning until I see you guys two days from now in the nighttime then at 8 p.m. Central Daylight Time on Thursday. Have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday today. Stay safe out there. And until two days from now on Thursday night, I'll give you the salute and the peace off and, and the peace out. The salute and the peace out. And uh, like I said, uh, until Thursday. We'll see you guys then. Take care, everybody.